Hi, and thank you so much for watching another episode of Past Conversations. Today, I am joined by Adele Redhead. She is a senior lecturer in information studies at the University of Glasgow. But I'm just going to pass across to her just now to let her say hello and maybe a wee bit about uh, what she does. Hi, um, thank you very much. Well, as she said, I'm currently a senior lecturer in information studies and my main role at the moment is to convene the MSc and postgraduate diploma in um, information management and preservation, which is the University of Glasgow's training uh, professional preparation master's programme for people who want to become archivists, records managers and digital curators. Before doing this, which was going into academia was a bit of a side slip. Before doing that, I did a history degree and then um, the Master of Archives and Records Management at Liverpool University. Um, and then I worked for a few years as an archivist and a records manager at various different organisations in the west of Scotland. Adele, our classic first question that I ask uh, everyone, and it's about your, your memories of studying history at a young age. It could be primary school, secondary school, um, absolutely whenever. What memories do you have? Um, I think a couple of things really stand out. The first is from primary school, and we had a teacher from the local secondary school come along to the primary school that I was at when I would have been about eight or nine, I think. Um, so a history teacher came, and we'd be learning about the world wars and I think it must have been in advance of um, Armistice Day coming up and we then went for a walk in the village that that I lived in at the time and we had a look at the war memorial and then the history teacher had done some work on the names of the village so like many villages of, of that size in fairly rural places then there are lots of surnames which were quite peculiar to the area um, and surnames which from you know the the first world war second world war um the surname still lived on and so there were people in the class with me who had the same surname as as people on the the war memorial and then we went for a walk around the village and you know this house and this particular family lived in this house and um how many people do you think lived there and they'd looked at the census records and it was all about that joining up with different sorts of information so the very physical war memorial being the starting point but then tying in with what we'd learned from from the books in class and what our teacher had been telling us and the films that we used to watching the TV programme so I don't know if it still exists in any shape or form but how we used to live um, that was the the typical sort of 20 minute episode that our teacher would would show us how how we used to live and and it was this ongoing story in various different historical contexts um, and all of this tied together and then when I was I took history at GCSE and then on to A level um, and for GCSE we studied um, the Second World War and the rise of the the Nazis and, and so on. And we went, one of the things that we did um, was to go and have a look at the, the battlefields and war memorials from the First World War and the Second World War. So I we went across to, to France and to Belgium to look at, at these things. And uh, I think we went to the Menin Gate and so on, probably a fairly typical battlefields tour. And I think for both of those, what really influenced my, my thinking and my career path later on was the fact that history isn't just something that you learn about in books. You can sit there and you can read a history book and you know some of it, but it's about that relationship between all sorts of different elements. So you've got the physical, so you have the war memorial or you have the, the battlefield. You have things like the recreation of the trench, which isn't, um, isn't necessarily the exactly the way it was but it's somebody's best guess about the way it was and we know this because it's supported by all sorts of different bits of evidence in different forms that might be archives or it might be a monument or it might be um, an oral history and it's about that piecing together of evidence that was that was really important that really captured my imagination when I was when I was a kid and still does capture my, my imagination today. I mean um you are <laughs> preaching preaching to the choir because um, certainly certainly for me um, when it when it came to me I, I sort of spoke about this in the last episode about how at the start of secondary school I, I didn't show a particularly strong interest in in, in history uh, and then of course we get to to where I am now and I'm I'm a history teacher and obviously something something changed along the way and it sounds like we've had quite sort of similar experiences because I remember 
a, a really strong memory of mine's in 1999 it was when when I went on a battlefield tour with the secondary school that I went to and to say that it was life-changing is is no exaggeration whatsoever I mean that now is my sort of um geeky kind of domain when it comes to to history and particularly the first world war and also sort of traits in the battlefields and uh, whenever whenever I do get the chance and you you sort of talked to it about the, the people um maybe as a way of leading you into the, to the subject and that's something I certainly kind of I suppose as a teacher we've all got kind of different approaches to to history and and whatnot but I quite like to tell the story of people and places and institutions and, and organizations and I'm sure as we talk more but for me, I, I, that's how I would approach an archive, look, looking to find out about the people, you know, the stories within and, and, and the organisations within. So that does seem like a, a sort of a lot of similarities there. And Yeah, and just thinking about one of the places we went to was a Commonwealth um, War Graves um, uh, cemetery site. And just thinking about the sheer scale of those, so the, the number of individual headstones and the recognition, I think, that each one of those headstones represented an individual life. And then I can't remember now which, which cemetery it was that we went to, but um, then at the back there was um, a big wall full of, of hundreds thousands probably of individual names and thinking back then to my earlier um looking at the the war memorial when i was when i was eight and i don't know there may be 20 or 30 names on that war memorial which for a small village we could still i could still then even at that age recognize the impact that that had and it's that joining together of of those but then the recognition that each one of those was was a person and i just like just like me just like everybody standing with me and the, the scale of it is absolutely mind-blowing um it will be i mean that i'm, I'm going to take a, a gamble here and say that that sounds like time caught um that you would have been at, at, at with that huge right. wall at the back um, uh -huh. and what always hits home about when when you visit there and and other i must say before anyone's triggered by this at other locations of smaller numbers um it, it is that for those people on the names that's because the you know the the person was never recovered there was never an, an identifiable mm -hmm. body so that's the, the the monument to the missing um, and, and I certainly believe as a teacher, and it's perhaps it's just what, what's worked for me, is that if I tell the story of the people, of the, you know, of, of the person, um, and I can sort of build out almost from there. And, and maybe if it's teaching the First World War, that's that's just how I go about to it. To capture people's, well, certainly as I say it's a way to capture people's imaginations. That's probably quite... Um, uh, that, that's the way my imagination was was captured and I think it's it's why if we look at earlier history so for A level then the Tudors was you know, fairly typical English A level um, so we studied the Tudors um, and of course that's all about the kings and the queens and people like Cranmer and you know all of these big personalities but that's because that's they're the people that we know about and it's I think then visiting sites visiting historic sites and thinking about that the people who weren't documented were still were still there and i think it's it's a really interesting tension in history between what was documented and and what wasn't and so whose lives were we able to remember um and of course with the wars with the 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 war graves then we're remembering people of every rank who are from every background and that's that's really it's really interesting on all sorts of different levels <laughs> Adele, this question really is, is about the day job. Just wondering, you know, as a senior lecturer, information studies at the University of Glasgow, what does your job actually involve? What do you do? Uh -huh. Well, in probably very, very similar to many of the people in academic roles that you've you've already interviewed, um, teaching, research and administration. I know that those three words have, have come up quite a lot in, in previous past conversations. So my job is a balance of teaching, of research and scholarship and of administration. Um, information studies is a, I think it's a department um, where people don't necessarily know what it is that we do. So we have two postgraduate degrees in information management and preservation, which is the degree I convene. So that's the professional preparation for archivists, record managers, digital creators. Um, we also have a sister programme to that in museum studies, and we've got an undergraduate degree in digital media and information studies. And I teach across all three programmes, so they primarily the IMP, the IMP programme. Um, and a lot of what I do involves 
teaching about the theory which underpins the way in which people practice when they're working as archivists and information and records managers. And I work in conjunction with a number of other different uh, different specialists, different people with different expertise and different experience. So they might be people who have worked in museums and galleries, people who've worked in libraries, people who've worked in digital curation. And I'm really fortunate that probably like many people have said, I've got a really great bunch of bunch of colleagues and we have really good interlocking, um, overlapping, uh, dovetailing experience and expertise. So archives is my specialism. And um, I think it's really important that I worked as an archivist for a few years before I, I accidentally fell into, into academia, um, because it means that I can really clearly see where theory and practice intersect. So where good practice should feed into theory and the theory should in turn help to influence good, good practice. So my job is to help the students see this. And so I spend a lot of my time teaching. So that might be lecturing, but typically at postgraduate level, it will be more seminar based teaching where you're expecting quite a lot from the students themselves. Um, so you're expecting a lot of contribution. It's not a case that they'll often sit and have an hour lecture. Um, actually, we expect a lot more contribution from them. Um, and we expect to bring them to bring their first degree and their experience and their 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 discipline and um, their disciplinary expertise from their first degree into their postgraduate study. Um, I suppose a typical day, like many of the academics, it really does depend. So at the moment, because it's the, the summer, so I'm supervising lots of students who are writing their dissertations. So this morning I had a few meetings with students who are looking at anything from um, access to archives for people with visual impairment. They're looking at records management policies in uh, English local authorities. Um, they're looking at the way in which the archive is representative of all sorts of different communities. So this, yeah. this might be a silly question. Um, it's more a curiosity. Um, how often then are you actually physically in what you would class as an archive? I mean, are, are you, do you find yourself quite distant from them or are you quite hands on? I mean, um, I'm quite hands on and the, the there's this awful tension in my professional life now in that I never intended to become an academic. I did my my A-levels, then I went to Aberdeen and studied history and I realised as a result of various different things when I was at Aberdeen that I wanted to be an archivist so I applied and, and got on the programme at Liverpool. Um, and I worked for a few years as an archivist and now I really miss that. I really miss the contact with the collection. So every chance I get, I'm in the archive. Um, in pre-COVID time, then the best two weeks of the year would be when our students were on placement and they would be on a practical uh, cataloging placement at any one of a number of different archives. Um, we had some students go internationally, so to the National Archives of Malta, for example, um, we had other students who would go to London to the Guardian and Observer or the House of Lords or the Victorian Albert or the National Theatre Archive. And lots of students would be much more, much more local. So Glasgow Women's Library, Glasgow City, the University Archives, any one of the number of different local authorities we have round about the, the Glasgow area, they go to these, these archives and do a cataloging placement. And the best bit about my job used to be to go and visit the students on placement and to see how they're getting on and what collections they're cataloging and see who they're working with. And quite often it will be with former graduates. So I get the chance to catch up with them. Um, then of course, COVID hit and we're left with the situation well, we can't expect students to go on placement in, in that way anymore. Um, I know it's difficult enough for, for schools having teachers on on placement and um, so it, it just wasn't possible it wasn't feasible so I don't think any of the the similar programs across the UK managed placements with COVID but what we were able to do when Scotland briefly opened up in 2020 in the summer then I was able to go into the archives and do some filming so um, the university archives invested in some really really good kits to enable virtual access so creating virtual search rooms and so I was able to go and firstly help them to trial that and um, but also to do some filming for for my class so with a member of staff from the university archives we're able to take a press cuttings book and um one of the members of staff was was sitting in the search room and able to to open that up um and i was asking particular questions about 
different elements of this particular this particular item in their collection um, and I was able to do a bit of that filming and other colleagues of mine were, were able to do filming with archives and with with special collections in level 12 in the library so any chance I get I like to be in the archive not often enough though probably yeah I mean I, mean, I, I can imagine um one of the one of the other things um and you might this might just be no it never happens i, I wonder it with the nature of uh, of your job and what you do and i suppose it depends on your specialism and what what archives in particular an archivist uh, curates or looks after but um there, mu there must be a tremendous feeling of excitement as an archivist when you probably think you've got everything or you're close to everything. Maybe maybe this is me being naive. <laughs> I don't know. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone opens up a box in a loft and they have this lost letter photograph. I I, I don't know. I mean, th is that is that? Are, are you like the the sort of? Is it like almost like an archaeologist? I <laughs> sort of wonder that this discovery factor. Yeah, I think so. And quite often, as an archivist, when when I was working as an archivist, I remember numerous occasions. Like I was archivist at Glasgow School of Art and. You'd, you know, you get stopped by the janitor on the way into the building and they say, oh, um, someone dropped a box off for the archive and you'd never know what was in it. And you, you'd, it's that magic of opening up the box and, and seeing, and it might be something that was totally relevant to what we would normally collect. Um, or it might be something that was absolutely wonderful, you know? So uh, papers of former staff and students. So you find that many archives in higher education institutions will collect the, the papers of their alumni and um, former members of staff and um, just seeing those and it's again it's it's linking back I think to the, the first answer it's about that that sort of human contact and it's there's something really magical about about seeing that collection these are the things which that individual had decided they they would preserve and you know we all know people who throw things away really easily and people who who hold on to things and it, it's whereabouts on that spectrum will this individual be what is it that they're giving us what will we want to keep is this is this collection relevant for for our archives should it go somewhere else um and every time you know archives are by their very nature unique and different and special um and it's just such a privileged position to be in to be the person who who actually looks at that collection and gets to to be the first to to start working through it and to catalogue it so that researchers can use it in the future. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's the best job. Adele, I, I kind of assume that, um, you know, as, as with history, bias um, play, can play a, a factor, a, a part in, in any kind of historical research or study. And, and I sort of wonder with, with archives, do you ever face any challenges when it comes to perhaps authenticity or, or you know, can can we trust all archives? I think that's a, a really interesting question and we could probably talk all day about the different layers in, in that question. So um, I think trust and authenticity are really important in the archive world, but it's probably best to start off by acknowledging that all archivists are people who come to the archive with their own set of, of expertise, their own set of interests already, their own set of biases. And it is unrealistic to imagine that they won't make their way through in some way, shape or form. So um, ultimately, we would hope that, that they wouldn't, that the archive is, is neutral, but actually the archive isn't neutral. Um, on a number of different levels and the archivists themselves aren't neutral so we we can't expect the archive to, to be neutral um when we're thinking about neutrality then um i spoke a bit earlier about the studying tudor history and it's the kings and queens and the the people of, of high rank and high office that that we we discuss and not the people who the everyday people who who actually made the country run made the um actually made the castle run on a day-to-day a -day basis and i think you see that it, it's quite clear when we're thinking about the tudors but you see that all the time we know more about the bosses of any organization than we do about the people who are doing the work you know everybody every pupil in your school every parent in your school will probably know who the head teacher is but not necessarily who the staff are much less who the the people are so i think it's it's there's a really interesting tent in there with regards to the way we think about what we preserve and what we try and collect. 
So all archives should have a collections policy and a collection strategy. So if we think about it in the university context, it's the University of Glasgow, it's, it's fairly typical in that the University of Glasgow will collect the institutional archive of the university, then it will collect the papers of um, former staff and students, and then the records which relate strongly to the university, but aren't necessarily generated by the university itself. So that might be student clubs and societies. So the Student Representative Council or the Glasgow University Football Club or the um, the Glasgow University Conservative Association, if such a thing exists, actually, I don't know. Um, and then also the University of Glasgow has lots of institutional records because that ties in with the research expertise of lots of Glasgow University staff and there's a whole history behind that. Um, but also now it's got this, this reputation as being a centre um, of specialism, so a specialist repository for things like shipbuilding records and industrial records which relate to the, the west of Scotland. And you asked me about authenticity and I think um, authenticity really it's about the perception of how genuine the records are and it's closely associated with the creator of those records and with the custodial history as well so with the university archives then we can assume that the records which relate to the institution, we have this strong custodial history. We know that they were generated in the offices of the university by staff of the university. So we can be reasonably confident that they are the authentic records. So if you go and look at the, the records of the principal's office or of individual academic departments or of the Senate or the court of the University of Glasgow, and you're looking at those in the University of Glasgow archives, then we, we can have a reasonable assumption that, that we can trust that they are the authentic records. But the further out you go from the heart of the University of Glasgow, then perhaps the more um, the more doubt there might be about the authenticity. So we could have the papers of a former member of staff come into the University of Glasgow. Well, we can do checks that that person was employed by the University of Glasgow, and we can check what the dates were and that they were em employed in a particular office or a particular role. But we have less certainty that the records that have come into us in that box actually were generated, collected by by that individual. So I think there's the temptation to think about is a record authentic or not, almost as a binary, and actually it's it's not, it's about the degrees. And as well, I think there's also the, the question about trustworthiness and about truth. And again, we could talk about this for, for quite a while, but it's, I think, really relevant for any student of history at, at any level to think about the trustworthiness of a, a record. And actually, sometimes records are interesting precisely because we think they don't contain what we might accept to be the truth or because they're not necessarily trustworthy. And that can tell us um, and tell the historian perhaps more about what it is that they're researching than than um, perhaps the, the institutional records where we have more of a guarantee if if we can put it like that that something is authentic so that's very wordy i hope that sort of answers your question yeah i i i, I every, everything you, you you say i 100 agree with uh, and i think it's one of the the things that either and i'm going to put all this under the banner of historical research because it's probably where i come from um but it's probably what either really attracts you to this type of study because you, you kind of like separating fact from fiction or, or, or having you know a certain degree of critical kind of thought and analysis when it comes to things or you don't because you like to take things at a sort of face value and I know that's quite general um, but I, I do I, I kind of like to sort of interrogate documents or place them within their context or, or think about the, the, the sort of circumstances um, that surround them so um, for me, that just that makes it even more interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, and of course, we can't ever keep everything that, that we get. So we wouldn't keep everything that the University of Glasgow generates. So in the process of setting this up, then I emailed you and then there were various different, you know, messages via, um, you know, Twitter private message all relating to the same the same topic, setting this up, um, setting up this 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 chat for this podcast and um, you wouldn't keep those that's that's not really it's a record of us setting something up but actually what's really interesting is the the final result so you don't keep you know the first draft of the book or the PhD or the second draft of the book or the PhD normally there it's actually the final result so archives don't keep everything and I, th I, I think 
in fact, I know before I did the archival training program, I had this view that an archivist would just welcome everything in open arms. You know, oh, we just take everything and we never throw anything away. We don't like to throw things away. But actually, archivists, we have to throw things away. And it's not benefiting the researcher if we don't throw things away. Otherwise, they, they just have too much to go through. So we need to decide what it is that we keep. And so there's the old saying, you know, all archives are records, but not all records are archives. And so everything that we keep in the archive should be a record of a transaction, the record of, of something. Um, but that might not be what it, what something, what any individual document is a record of might not be entirely clear, entirely clear cut. So I remember cataloging a collection once that was a scrapbook and it contained a scrapbook of um, uh, somebody's it was someone who liked going to the theatre a lot so they would have you know the the theatre ticket and the program and they'd have details of how they got there and if they had been for a meal in advance then they might have the menu or or, or you know that that sort of thing it was a really nice document of, of their life but looking at the ticket they might have their train ticket going from from Glasgow through to Edinburgh that train ticket isn't a record of the fact that they did that journey it's just a record of the fact that they paid the money to entitle them to do that journey so I think it's it's that sort of critical thinking about what things are records of is is really one of the most interesting things of of the job as an archivist. One, one thing I, I also wonder um, so the, the school where I work at to, to give an example um, we have an archive stretching say over 100 plus years now mm -hmm. and if, if you sort of look at the, the types of things that are in it you know there's school newsletters or school photographs magazines uh certificates from award ceremonies all, all sorts of things that really and you go up to about the sort of late 90s early 2000s and what you see is the paper content drastically starting to reduce there's this sort of five ten year period where we, all of a sudden there's cd-roms are sort mm -hmm. of appearing and maybe USB sticks. And now we get to where we are now. And to be quite honest, there, there, there's really nothing. And I'm not exaggerating that because everything is now sent by email or it's put up on YouTube. Um, it's it's there to download. And, and you know, that's, that's a sort of a, a, a small example. But I, I wonder, I don't know if you're finding this or have been finding this for some time, that as we've moved into the 21st century, you know, and we move digitally. I, I say we, we need to stop saying that we move digitally. We're, we're there. We're, we're in amongst it. Um, is that is that having an impact on, on what you can and what you do store? Yeah, absolutely. And it's had an impact on the way the the archivist needs to think about their collections on several different levels. So in terms of of preservation and potential access. Um, but also in how we get the material in the first place. So um, we can take a bit of a bit of paper and we can put it in a cupboard and most of the time, unless something goes wrong, it will still be there in 10, 50, 100 years time. Um, and obviously there are things that we can do to help with that. And there are some paper and other analog um, records, which are, are easier to keep than others. So, you know, newspaper is very hard, um, but something printed on good quality paper, it should, or written on good quality paper, it should, it should last. You can't do that with the digital. You can't put, burn something onto a CD-ROM and then expect in 10, you know, even five years time, people to be able to access that. And so there's a lot of work being done in the community surrounding digital preservation and digital curation. And that's why it's a really important element of what the archivist needs to have in their, their toolkit. We're really fortunate at Glasgow in that we've got an organisation called the Digital Preservation Coalition based in the same building as us. So we're able to um, make the most of their expertise. But if anyone's interested in a career in archives, then it's well worth going and having a look at their website. Um, so the Digital Preservation Coalition, and they produce every year, every two years, um, a watch list of formats which are at risk. So it's worth going and having a look at that. But we can't sit back with the digital and do nothing and expect it to come to us in the same way that the, the analog records, the hard copy physical records would come to us. Remember when I trained as a, an archivist more than 20 years ago now, then there was this sort of attitude of, well, for a lot of it, you could probably just print it out. But that doesn't really work because email, we use email in a different way to the way that we would use hard copy correspondence. So if we sat down to write a letter, it might cover several different 
topics at once in that that one letter whereas emails go fine back and forth and they're very instant it's very instant response there's far more of them you don't want to be printing all of those out but also because we use it in a different way it, it's it we can't sort of just treat it in the same way as you might um correspondence and then of course we've got the beauty of technology that allows us to do things like create databases and spreadsheets and websites and they behave in a very different way so a website on the Tudors, then you can jump between topics. So you might want to have a look at buildings that people live in and jump between the, the, the topics. Whereas that would have to be presented in a very linear way if it was a book and you wouldn't be able to jump in the same way between, between different things. So we can't just treat these things in the same way for all sorts of different, different reasons. So it's really important that we consider the digital. Yeah, uh, uh, one one thing um, I sort of wondered. She spoke about digital preservation there. I wonder if it's been the unintended consequence, if that's the right way of putting it. That um, so someone like me um, who um, would quite, you know, have often have quite geeky interests and in sort of wonderful random weird things with digital preservation. Um, certainly last year during lockdown, a lot of institutions were sort of certainly seemed to have this kind of open access policy that, you know, presumably they were scanning these documents. Maybe they had already been, I don't know, but, and then they were all of a sudden, they were opened up to the public in some instances free, free of charge. And um, that for me, I, I, I think is something I am quite excited about as a non-archivist that, uh, there may be more opportunities to, you know, it's it's very. I mean, I'm, I'll say this: I've been in the Glasgow Uni Archive once, and I, and I feel really lucky that I got that opportunity. But I don't think that's an opportunity that everyone would get. Not because it's closed off. I'm sure you could arrange a visit. I think I don't know. Um, but but to have things online, uh, on the one hand, digitally preserving the document, but also opening up to the public, that, that, that's a really, that's a really exciting and good thing. I think. Yeah, absolutely. But I think there's this this notion that the archive should just digitise everything and make it all available. And that's impossible when you consider it's impossible for all sorts of reasons. So, you know, you've got the 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 problem of resourcing that to create high quality digital images is really time consuming. So it's not just about taking a photo of the image. You know, you need to have the expertise and the equipment to be able to do that but also the staff time to create the metadata, so the data about data, which needs to be attached to every image. So you could digitize you know, all of one collection, but if you don't actually say what it is and link that to a, a collection catalog, then it's it's almost useless for, for most users. You know, you might be able to flick through lots of really interesting examples of somebody's handwriting in their diary, but if you don't have the context, then then what's, what's the point? Um, so I think we've seen digitization happen for um, records which are high of high interest so lots of people would would want to look at them or records which might be at risk if if too many people look at them so you, you know we we're all used to watching old detective stories where they you know the detective goes and they they visit the library or the archive and they're looking at microfilm and you know you see the microfilm reader which there's hardly any in existence, some in existence in archives and libraries now, but but hardly any. But I think most people are familiar with the, the microfilm reader and the, the detective looks at the newspaper online and then has that light bulb moment, the breakthrough in the case. Um, so newspaper is really hard to to look after because the paper is really acidic and, so, and it, it's really big. And so that sort of thing we digitize. But in terms of digitizing everything it's really difficult to to see how that could be done because archives just hold so much stuff so i think you're right that um lots of organizations like larger archive repositories were digitizing um firstly digitizing on demand for people who wanted particular collections and um, they had staff who were able to go in relatively safely um to digitize but also were making available collections or items that they'd already digitized um, for for people to, to be able to access in a way that they wouldn't normally have been able to do. Adele, just
just before we have to finish up our conversation, I, I'm just curious about um, any, I don't know, top tips, advice that you might have for, for someone, say, that either has a, a sort of a, a hobby type interest in archives or for anyone that might be sat listening, watching this and thinking, do you know what, that, that's a career for me. I would like to go into that. What, what would be your, your advice? Well, firstly, I think archives is an amazing career, so I would I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Um, I think there are two two things. So first of all, keep your eye on the news, and every single day you'll see news stories come up, which tells us how important archives and records management and digital curation is. So we're sitting here in the summer of 2021, and I think over the last five years, the the whole of the UK political landscape has undergone um, huge change and huge. We've, we've experienced huge events, so not just COVID, but also Brexit. And every single day, then on the news, I'll see news stories where archives and records keeping is really at the heart of it. So, um, for example. Uh, Matt Hancock and CCTV, um, the Dominic Cummings revelation about uh, WhatsApp messages from the Prime Minister and WhatsApp being used instead of official email channels. Um, all of that is relevant to archives and actually starting to think about these issues and about what archives will collect in the future um, and how archives will still be important as we continue through the 21st century is, is really relevant. The other thing I'd suggest that people do is to start looking, go have a look on websites of archives. So the National Archives website based down in Kew, that's a really good place to start. So go and have a look at what, what's available there. Um, you can find their website um, if you just Google TNA Archives, um, then you'll find their website. And they've got lots of really useful education resources. So I know that when we had the lockdowns and schools were closed, that for both my secondary age child and my primary age child, then having a look at what the National Archives had in terms of, of history and education resources was, was really useful. Um, so go and have a look there. And they've got some really useful pages as well on how to start using archives. But also then think about what the local archive is to you. So what local authority do you live in? Where, where is the archive? So it might be Glasgow City or East or Western Bartonshire or Renfrewshire. And what do they have available? So all of these um, local authorities will be keeping archives, as will many other different organisations. So the University of Glasgow Archive, I've already mentioned. Um, and just have a look at their websites and see what it is that they hold. Is there anything that you'd be interested in going along and looking at? And obviously, COVID makes all of this more difficult, but just get in touch with the archive and arrange to go in and, and have a look. Sometimes you'll need to say what your research interest is. Uh, but archivists are really helpful. We want people to come in and look at the archives. So do just get in touch. Yeah.